What is my purpose? What is my destiny? What is my passion that consumes every breath of me? So full of life, and I want to use every breath I breathe to sound the alarm in my face and awaken to my destiny. We are the next generation, the youth of today, and the leaders of tomorrow. Our faith is strong, our potential is limitless, and if you give us a cause to fight for, we will change the world. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Uh-oh, must be the week after resolution started. Let's try again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> so good to see everybody here, and we're grateful to be back now that we're returned from all of our traveling at the end of the year, visiting family, and it's just so good to be back home. Amen. So before I get to work, a couple of announcements. Uh, you already saw the little promo video for the 21 days of prayer and fasting, which is going to be starting next week. So if you go out of the sanctuary, not right now, but as you go out of the sanctuary at the little kiosk that's right there outside the door, you'll see the information about Awake 21. There's some information there about fasting and prayer. And be back here during the midweek Bible study as we talk about fasting and prayer, <laughs> praying, and fasting and prayer. Uh, so please be a part of that. The second one, of course, like I mentioned, midweek Bible studies start up next Wednesday, the 11th, and they start at 7 p.m. So be here Wednesday night, 7 o'clock uh, on the 11th to be a part of the midweek Bible study. We, like I said, we'll be talking about fasting and prayer and life groups. So life groups are starting back up in February. Uh, so I know we have some folks out here who would like to lead a life group, if that is you. Uh, on January 21st, from 11 to 1, we will have our leadership training. So before we start life groups, we ask that any life group leader meets with us and goes through some leadership training. So I want to make sure you get that. So the 21st, from 11 to 1 in the afternoon. We will give you lunch, so don't worry. It's not going to be boot camp. So you come in and enjoy some time, enjoy some fellowship, and get some good information on how to start a life group here at Living Hope. Amen? Amen. Now let's pray. Father, we are excited because it's a new year. Even though today is the 8th and it's already had seven days to kind of walk through 2012, we're excited for a new year. We're excited for change. We're excited for what you're going to do. And God, we are so grateful that you believe in us. So show us how to believe in others. And as we go through this, God, I am so grateful that you called me to this work. You called me to go out and meet people, to share, to remind people that there is a God that believes in them. And this morning, I'm grateful that you called me to talk about attitude because you have a fantastic attitude for us. And we want to mirror that attitude back out to others. So God, use us all in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So here we are at the beginning of the year, and I, like I mentioned before, January 1st came, and I'm sure that unlike the rest of you, you guys are powering through your New Year's resolutions, and you're getting them done, and you're ticking those things off, and you're being successful in all the things that you called yourselves to do. But let me tell you, I was that guy that at the end of the year was concerned about 2011's New Year's resolutions. So I was trying to get things done, get things done at the end of the year, things that I said I was going to do in January. And here I am in December running and doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that. But still, even at the end of the year, I still didn't get everything done. But I know I'm the only one who fell into that particular trap. And there was one New Year's resolution that I wanted to get out of the way before 2011 was over uh, because I didn't want to be that guy. But, like I said, I hemmed and I hawed, I didn't do it, I looked at the numbers, I said it wasn't going to fit. So I was the guy joining the gym at the beginning of the year. 
I never wanted to be the guy joining the gym at the, at the beginning of the year. Now, notwithstanding my stomach that's up here that all of you can see, I actually enjoy working out. I like to work out. I like to swim. I like to ride bikes. I don't like running, but, you know, all those other things I do like to do. But I never wanted to be the guy at the gym on at the beginning of the year. See, I, if you've ever been to a gym, you guys all are aware of what happens at the beginning of the year. New Year's resolutions. Now, we just finished up with Christmas. Everybody remembers the mall parking lots around, you know, right after Black Friday, between Black Friday and Christmas Eve of all days, the nightmare that is the mall parking lot? Well, let me tell you, the gym parking lot at the beginning of the year is no better. In some cases, it's even worse. And as I joked with the guys at the gym, you know, they, I've been in part of a lot of different gyms as I've moved around the country, and they all have terms that they use for the new people who join the gym at the beginning of the year. I won't share all of those terms, but they know that they'll have a lot of people that'll come in in January 1st, but by around March, sometimes by the end of January, those people, while they may still pay their bill because they had to sign up for a contract, they won't see them anymore. So even the gym that I'm a part of, they don't even give you the fancy smancy membership card when you join. They give you a temporary card. And when I look on the back of it, the temporary card actually has an expiration date on it of March 1st. So if you're still there at March 1st, then they'll give you the cool card with your picture on it and all of that great stuff and get you through and in faster. But until then, you got to swipe in, you got to give them the card, you got to make sure they know who you are because they know that people aren't going to uh, stick it out. So as I pray for you guys in the month of January through the prayer and fasting, I am praying that you will stick to whatever the resolutions are that you called and you started to work on. Because I believe that you can do it. I believe and know that you're capable of doing great things. Amen? Amen. So back at the gym. So it's the day after New Year's. I didn't even go on New Year's Day. Okay, so the day after New Year's, here I am going into the gym and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to work out. So I've already gone in. There's like 8 million people piling in behind me and everybody's trying to get to the locker room to get changed. And, and I said, okay, I'm going to do something that I enjoy doing because this is my first workout for 2012. And I grabbed my, my goggles here that I was wearing this morning, if any of you caught me wearing them. And I threw them on and I grabbed my water bottle and out I went to the pool. So I grabbed the lane and put my water bottle down, making sure that, hey, this, this is my lane, okay? Don't anybody get in this lane. And I threw my towel down and, and started to do my little swim and was going back and forth up the lanes. And there were other people that were in the pool, and, man, they were determined. Let me tell you, they were slicing the water, and they were splashing and kicking, and water was going everywhere. And I'm like, wow, these guys are on it for January 2nd. So I got in, and I'm in there just enjoying my little swim and I'm having a good time, and I'm relaxing, and even got a little bit bored about maybe 10 minutes in, because I really wasn't pushing it, I really wasn't doing any of that stuff, and as the guy that ran the triathlon, you know, those guys are out there, and they're killing it in the water, and when you're racing, you're killing it, but let me tell you, I was at the gym, and I, I was doing the backstroke, just, just floating, you know, walking up and down the lane, but as I watched, you know, 8 million people in the gym, more people started to show up to swim. And they started picking off the people who were determined, and they were going up to them, hey, can I share your lane? And I'm going, oh, God, please, I don't want to share my lane with anybody. I'm really enjoying this swim. And surely enough, somebody came, and they said, hey, excuse me, do you mind if I share the lane with you? <sighs> sure. The guy looked at me, because I really did do that deep breath sigh, like, oh, okay, sure. And he jumps in, and we talk for a few minutes, and then off he goes, man, he is slicing and going and he's doing the kick flip thing at the other end and pushing off and coming back and I'm still standing there like okay what am I going to do with this guy you know but as I was sitting there and as I was standing there in the water watching this guy swim and some of the people around me I really began to realize how important it is to share your lane how important it is to be a part of the work that God is doing how important it is to actually grab a hold of people and bring them along the journey and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today and talk to you about the attitudes involved in sharing your lane. So last week, Pastor Paul gave a message and he talked about thinking generationally. He talked about the next generation, those who will come behind us. And he mentioned some very important things. The first one being the importance of a supporting environment, creating that support system, having people around 
the youth, around the young people, around the people who you're mentoring. So no matter what, you're all, you guys are all working on different things. You're going to be dealing with youth if you're in a youth ministry working with young people. You're going to be mentoring people on the job. You're going to be mentored. Creating a supporting environment is so very important. Raising expectations. We are not in the, in the business here in America anymore of talking about put in 110% and, and be the best and do this and do that. Now, if you're in an environment like that, please praise God and stay there. Okay, because I've been in environments where it's kind of like get in, find your place, and then do as much as you can not to get fired. Only do as much as you can to make sure your head doesn't pop up so people don't really notice you. Stay in, get it done, get your paycheck, and walk out. But we're not called to do that. We're called to raise expectations. And the last one is keeping it real. Understanding where people are coming from. Knowing who they are. Dealing with them where they are. Because you've got to do that in order to really think generationally. Because God does that. God thinks generationally. Go to your Bible. Find the book of Genesis. There's a list of names. Go into the New Testament. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, there's a list of names. And those lists of names are not there because you're tired and you need to find a way to go to sleep. I do believe God blesses us in that sometimes, but I'm telling you those names are there for a reason. And the reason is to remind you that God thinks generationally. He's thinking about your great, 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 great grandparents. And he's also thinking about your great, 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 great grandchildren and saving from generation to generation to generation. And so we have to do that. And in order to do that, we've got to have an attitude that says, I want to do more than just my own timeline. So not just about your generations, the kids that you may have already, or the kids that you may have in the future, but also about all the kids, the young people, the youth, the people you mentor that are around you. You've got to think about the people who will come after you. And so that kind of leads us into our flagship scripture, because uh, Pastor Paul shared uh, Mark 9, 23 last week, but I want to just back it up and show you Mark 9, uh, chapter... Uh, Mark 9, 22. And in Mark 9, 22, you see this passage where Jesus is talking to, or a father is talking to Jesus about his demon-possessed son. And he's coming to Jesus, asking Jesus to heal. And he's saying, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can, highlight, emphasis Carlton, okay, that's not in your Bible. You won't see the, uh, the capitals there. But if you can do anything, Take pity on us and help us. And Jesus, being Jesus, you go to verse 23, says, if you can. Note the question mark. It wasn't a, you know, he was actually saying, if you can. Everything is possible for one who believes. And I think a lot of times we do that. Lord, if you can. Lord, if you're able. Lord, if you're willing. But here's the thing. God, nothing is impossible with God. So when you go to him, when you go to the doctor, don't you expect to be healed? When he gives you medication, don't you expect that that cold is going to go away? So, Lord, if you can, I don't want to hear that anymore. It's not an if you can. And there are challenges and there are things that God is trying to teach us in the midst of the struggles that we go through. But it's not an if you can, Lord. It's a what's after. What do I do after this? I think we heard that this week. What do I do after the pain is gone? What do I do after the struggle is over? What do I do after the victory is won? What do I do after? So like I said, today's message is all about attitude. And why do we have to do it? I mean, I'm walking with God. I love God. He's my God. I walk with him. Why do I need any of y'all? Why do I need to walk with you? I've got God. I'm walking with him. I love him. He loves me. I'm walking with him. He's taking me from glory to glory to glory, from victory to victory to victory. But you know what? God said... You need to walk with other people. So if I'm only walking with him, I'm not doing what he called me to do. 
if my life is all about me and my walk with God and only my walk with God, I'm not doing what God called me to do. He called each and every one of us to walk with other people. He called us to be around other people. And Jesus even demonstrated it. He was around other people. So that should be a lesson for all of us. But there are also some things that happen, some improvements, some benefits to walking with other people, some benefits to sharing your lane. And I'm going to use my, my story from earlier about being at the gym because it really did kind of crystallize what I was going to talk about today. The very first thing that it does is that it improves your form. It also challenges you to do better, and it builds relationships. Think about it. I'm in the pool. The lanes are not very wide, and there's now two of us. So at the very least, I've got to improve my form enough so that I don't collide with this guy that's doing the kick flips at the other end and powering through. Okay? So no matter what, that has to happen. And that's biblical. I mean, if you look at Proverbs uh, chapter 27, verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I mean, that's your men's ministry verse there. That's the one every men's ministry I've ever been in has had this verse somewhere in their mission because it sounds tough. But the key is, no matter whether you're a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, doesn't matter. When you're around other people, it sharpens you. And Pastor Paul makes a joke about what happens when you take a group of Christians and you throw a non-believer in the middle. I mean, it changes the conversation. It changes the atmosphere. It changes what people say because it sharpens you to be around others. And then if you take a look at uh, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, it says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. It challenges you when you share your lane. So remember, I was a slow-paced guy. I was just chilling out in the water, just enjoying, just floating, swimming. But let me tell you, I had this guy doing mega laps next to me. Oh, no. Oh, no, we can't have that. So now my, 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 my swim stroke is, is stronger. My arms are beating the water. I'm swimming harder. My feet are kicking. And he and I, I'm determined that I'm either going to meet him right in the center of the pool or I'm going to beat him to the center of the pool. That's it. That's all it is. Because it challenges you when somebody's around. When I, was, when I had my triathlon coach, he was, it was the same way. He would never let me swim in the lane on my own. Even if we had an entire pool in the middle of the day and there was nobody else there, he always got in my lane. And that was what he always would say. Because you're going to work harder if you're watching me beat you every lap. And yes, I know it's not all about competition. I know that the, the, the work of God is not about being better than somebody else or working harder than somebody else. However... There is something to be said for working hard in the kingdom, for being better than you were yesterday, for being more committed to the work than you were yesterday, to be involved more than you were last year. And you, it's very hard to do that on your own because you're awesome all by yourself. Okay, you know what? I'm sorry. You guys are, are better than me. I'm awesome all by myself. So if I'm in a pool by myself, whatever laps I do, whatever time I get through it, it's awesome. However, that guy and the people that were around me showed me that I wasn't so awesome. And even as I swam next to this guy, I wasn't so awesome. But you know what? It challenged me to keep going. And that's why we need to work one with the other. Why we need to grab a hold of the young people and work with them one and the other. And one-on-one, -on -one, talk to them about what they're going through. Talk to the people that we're trying to train. Talk to the people that are surrounding us. Because here's the thing. There's not a whole lot of people here from a leadership perspective. But there's a whole lot of people out there. So you can grab a hold of the person sitting next to you and talk to them about what they're going through. And walk with them through what they're going through. Because that's what we're called to do. And the third one, of course, building relationships. Because let me tell you, there's nothing more uh, comfortable than two guys in the pool. Okay? So I had debated on whether or not to actually wear my trunks today, and I opted not to. I didn't think my wife would appreciate that. So I wore my goggles 
just kind of as an, as, as an example. So you got two guys, they're in the pool, they're not that far away from each other, and we're wearing goggles and we look silly because nobody can make the goggle look, look cool. Only Michael Phelps can make swimming look awesome, okay? Because no matter what, at the end of the race, you're still smacking water and there's water going everywhere. Only those Olympic guys can make that look cool, okay? But it builds relationship. So when we would both be worn out, tired, because he was racing me as much as I was racing him, let me tell you. When we stopped at the same end, we stopped and we talked. And it builds relationship. And so in the book of Amos, in your Old Testament, chapter 3, verse 3, it says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? You can't walk together with somebody unless you have agreed to do so. You can't join a church and be a part of a ministry or even have friends unless you've agreed to do that. Nobody in here has been kidnapped and made to come to Living Hope Church. Your best friend didn't grab you, put a gun to your head and say, you're now going to hang out with me for the next 10, 15 years. It's just, not, it's just not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. So you've got to agree to it. And so it is a serious agreement when you join the church. That's why we have the LHC 101 class, and we talk to you about what we believe, and we talk to you about how we walk and how we live as a church, because it's important that you know what it is that you're agreeing to. I mean, it's one, I mean you're, you're saying when you join a church that the pastor of that church is your leader. That's a big deal. See, a lot of us only do that when there's a paycheck involved. But you voluntarily join a church. You voluntarily join. You voluntarily say, I'm going to submit to leadership. So you need to know and understand that it's an agreement that you make. So what does it all mean, right? So there's some benefits. Improves your form, challenges you, builds relationships. Those are all the great things that come out of sharing your lane. But how does that look? How do we apply that? Where does that, how does that work? As one of my pastor friends says, how do I wash the dishes on this? You know, what's the, what's the work to get this thing into me? So what I wanted to share with you is that there are a couple of roles that you'll play in this sharing of your lane. And each one kind of builds, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go from the top level on down. But we all kind of fall into these roles as we go through life. The first one is the coach. The coach, somebody who protects, somebody who teaches, somebody who challenges. That's who a coach is. That's what a coach does. They protect the people that are around them. I mean, if you've ever played a sport or you've ever been in a club and you've had a coach, I had a triathlon coach, I've had football coaches, even though, as you can tell, I probably didn't play a whole lot of football. I mean, it's just how it worked itself out. There have been coaches in my life. I've had business coaches. I've had mentors in my life. And their job is to protect me as I start to learn the things that they're teaching. They, they, they teach me things. They teach me new ideas. They give me new ways to, to do things. And they challenge me. You can do better than that. And here's the deal. If you find yourself in a coaching relationship where you are the coach, your attitude has to be approachable. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes you may have to be tough. Sometimes you may have to be stern. You may have to correct. But it is a lot easier to correct bad behavior when you connect with them first. Let me repeat that. It is a lot easier to correct bad behavior when you connect with people first. Don't just walk up to somebody and tell them they're in sin if you don't even know who they are. Connect with them first. Find out what they're about. Find out the background of their lives. Learn to walk with them first before you just hit them over the head and tell them that they're wrong. So let's, so let's take a look at how that works itself out from the Bible. So take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. Paul was Timothy's coach. He was his leader. He was the, the one who was teaching and training him. And if you want some examples, go to First and Second Timothy. These are letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, teaching and training him in how to deal in situations, how to grow, how to be the pastor. But he always started with something like this. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul was a coach. He prayed for those churches that he established. He prayed for the leadership. He loved the leadership. He always spoke with, even in letters where he gave them rebuke, he always spoke with an attitude of, I love you, an attitude of we're close, an attitude that I'm interceding for you, an attitude of grace and mercy and peace from God, the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. That is how he talked to them. 
And as coaches, that's how we've got to deal one with the other. We've got to talk to the people who are mentoring. and We've got to connect with them and get close with them and teach them and train them that way. And then if you take a look at uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 18, where Jesus is talking to the, the rich young ruler, it says, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. A harsh challenge. A very harsh challenge if you know your Bible. Take a look at Luke, what happened in Luke 18, 19. And see, I'm a coach and I'm a teacher by trade, so I give homework. So go read Luke 18. See what happened to the rich young ruler. See how he responded to this challenge. Because Jesus left it there. He said, do this. Find out how he responded. But as a coach, sometimes you will have to challenge the people around you. They cannot grow if you do not challenge them. It's great to tell young people that they're awesome. I think we should. I think we should let them. I think you should let your mentees know how proud you are of them. You should let those people on your job who are working under you, you should let them know that they're doing a good job. But it can't just be you're awesome. Let that land for a second. It can't just be you're awesome. For the parents in the room, it can't just be how great you are. I love you and you're so smart and you're so beautiful and you pick good clothes. I have girls, so you know my, my words are going to be, you might have boys, but you're, you're beautiful and I love the way you did your hair today and you're, you did great on that test and oh, you got four stars, that's amazing. And then leave it there. Can't do it. They've got to be challenged to do better. How are you going to do on this next test? What are you reading? What book are you going to pick up? Are you going to, are you going to finish? What book are you going to start? How's that math coming? Or to take it to it from a church perspective, for those of you who might be joining a small group when we start those back up, your leaders will be asking you, what are you reading? What are you studying? How, is it, how are you applying it to your life? They're going to find out how things are going. They're going to challenge you to study and read. Because you've got to be able to show yourself approved. Amen? All right, so the next one is the trainee. I'm sorry, the peer. So I'm going in the wrong order. The peer, these are when you're hanging out with your, your small group. So let's take the small group example, right? So you've got the coach, you've got the leader. Now you've got the people who are in the group. So how do you react? How do you respond? How do you operate one with the other? You practice, number one. You're going to practice the things that you're learning. You're going to put them into practice. You're going to walk together and practice your faith. You're going to walk together and study. You're going to walk together and challenge one another. You're going to connect with the people who are next to you in the walk. You're going to connect with the people that are next to you in the race. And you're going to grow together. You're going to grow together, and sometimes with growth comes challenge. Sometimes with growth comes conflict. But you're going to grow together in the faith. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. 2 Kings chapter 2. No, nope, that's wrong. Acts 15, 39. I should have had just paper notes. So they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. So here's a situation where two people that were walking together, they were growing together, uh, Paul, and John, Paul and Barnabas, who had just returned, had come back from tremendous success on the field, planting churches, growing leaders, seeing people come to Christ. And now it was time to go out on the next mission. And Paul and Barnabas were talking, and Barnabas said, hey, let's take Mark with us, John Mark. And Paul says to him, I will not take John Mark. He deserted us earlier. So here's another homework assignment. Go back and read Acts. Great stories of how the church grew and how they connected peer to peer, how they connected and grew and practiced their faith. But here was a situation where you had Paul and you had Barnabas and they were together and they had done amazing things. But on this, they could not agree. And the disagreement was so sharp that two men who had been out on the field parted company. But here's the thing about growing and having conflict in the church. If you part company, you can't part company and just vanish. You can't part company and just go away. 
You can't part company and fade to black. What are you doing when you part company? Barnabas, the son of encouragement, took John Mark with him, and they did amazing things for God. And Paul left, and he went this way, and he did amazing things for God. He didn't get angry and say, you know what, well, forget you, I'm going to go home and do nothing. Forget you, I'm going to go fade away and not be a part. They both knew and were united in what God had called them to do. And they said, you know what, we don't agree on this, but we know what the mission is. And they went off and did for God. And that's what you do when you have conflict. That's what you do when you don't agree. If you disagree so much that you can't, you, you guys can't walk together, but you can agree to walk separately, but on the same mission, same mission united for God. You can do that, and it is possible. And then we have Acts 3, 6. So here we have Peter and John, and they're walking into the gate called Beautiful, and they've met a, a beggar who's there, and he can't walk. He's been disabled from birth. And people brought him there and put him there outside of the gate called Beautiful. And he begged for money each and every day as the people made their way to the temple. Peter and John walking for prayer, walking to the ministry, walking together in their work. And they meet this guy outside the gate called Beautiful. And, and Peter turns to him and says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk and that man stood took up his mat and didn't go home but followed them into the temple courts shouting jumping and praising God they practiced their faith as they walked together Peter and John walking together practicing their faith connecting to one to another because those walks were not short it's not like you know we drive to church and then we got to walk up the little sidewalk there to get in getting to the temple was often a hike and so when you're walking with somebody you think they were talking to each other do you think they were discussing Christ and they were discussing the, 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 the world that they were going out into and working in do you think they were even discussing life just whatever was going on in each other's lives what they were seeing do you think they were doing that yes they were connecting but when the moment came they practiced their faith and they grew and saw God move Practice, connect, and grow. Then the last one is the trainee. And this is when you are listening. This is when you are trying to learn the fundamentals. This is where you are learning about this. To take the church concept or what we do here at Living Hope, this is where you're being discipled. Or somebody is pouring into you. You come to church on a Sunday morning. You're discipled. You're in a small group. You're being discipled. You've got a mentor at work. They're teaching you. They're learning something. There's some fundamentals. For those of us who may have ever been in the sales realm, there's a, an upline person who's there teaching you the trade craft. There's somebody at your job. If you're in IT, you've got a manager who's teaching you something. You've always got somebody who's teaching you something. The question is, are you learning? And then you practice it. So you learn and you practice while your mentor watches, while your mentor is keeping an eye, while you're able to walk with them and practice your faith. And you're growing. You're not really training if you're not getting better. Amen? I just want to make sure we, that lands, okay? If you're, if, 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 you're, if you're finding that what you're doing, you're not getting any better, and you're also not talking to your coach, you're not really training. You're just playing around. Remember that serious agreement we talked about earlier? When you take on a coach, that means that you've got to reach out to them if you're finding that things are not working. You can't just disappear on your coach. Now, your coach isn't allowed to let you disappear either. They're supposed to be reaching out to you, but there's also an agreement that you make to reach out to your coach. If you find that you're doing something and nothing is happening, man, you need somebody to talk to. You need somebody to follow up with. You need somebody to learn from. So learn, practice, and grow. One of my favorite examples, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Elijah and Elisha. Go in the Kings. Read about Elijah. Read about Elisha who followed him. When they had crossed, 
Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha responded with, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. So earlier on, Elijah had been told, Today the Lord is going to take you. And so he, it seems like, in my opinion, he was trying to kind of go off over on the side and let the Lord take him, and, and then he would be gone. But Elisha, no, I'm going with you wherever you went. And there's a whole set of passages where Elijah went here and he went there, and Elisha was right there with him, just going, 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 going. But the Lord said he was going to take Elijah. And so Elijah finally turned to him and said, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elisha, who had seen so many amazing things happen in the life of Elijah, had seen how God had moved, had seen how God had provided, had seen how God had restored and healed and, and overcome. He says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Are you ready to inherit a double portion? Have you followed to a degree that you even know what that looks like? Because that's the thing that I always see. I've seen people, I mean, I, I've been in churches, um, and I've seen people come in, and they join a church, and they immediately want to, I'm in leadership. I want to be a leader. But the question is, have you spent enough time being trained and being under to understand what it even means to be in leadership? And just because you came from a church somewhere else, doesn't mean that you know what it means to be a leader in a different church. We did our great football. Our, our pastor's wearing his, uh, his football jersey today. Do you know the plays that he calls? If you don't know what plays he calls, how can you be the defensive coach? How can you be the head of the offensive line if you don't know the plays that they're going to call from the, the box? You don't know. So take the time to walk with your leadership. Take the time to know the plays that they're going to call. Take the time to understand. And as a trainee, your attitude is all about listening to the people that you're being led by, paying attention to what they say, actually doing the things that they've asked you to do. I know it's a novel idea. But again, back to that serious agreement. If you said, you're my coach and I'm going to follow the plays that you call, if he calls a play you don't like, you still run it. And yeah, you might take a hit. It happens. Your leaders are not perfect. They're not always going to get it right. That doesn't change the fact that they're the leader. And I know it's hard in our church shopping uh, kind of consumeristic culture where if I don't feel comfortable I'm going to go off somewhere else I know it's difficult but still got to do it that's the agreement so if you go somewhere else and you sit under another leader you still have a place to follow no matter what I don't care how big the church is. Joel Osteen's church in Houston, they're still calling plays, and you still got to follow somebody. And if you ever want to see a, a machine run, go visit Lakewood in Houston. Because that is a machine. They get them in, they get them out. That's how service works. They got the people, they got one way to drive in, as the other people are driving out, so you have parking. You got guys out there with flags telling you to go this way, go that way. You get into the service, there, you know, you're in an auditorium, so you got seats all the way around here. So when you come in, there's people there, like at the at a at a sporting event. There's somebody saying, What what seat are you gonna sit in? Come down, go over here. I mean think about how many people it is, right? I mean there's a there's ushers and there's greeters and there's small group leaders. Joe Osteen can't come visit you in the hospital when you're sick not going to happen. But there are people there that will come visit you. But again, no matter what, there's plays to be called. So we're a small church. Things happen very differently than they do in a church of 50,000 or however many people are there. 
They even happen differently than, you know, a church of 300. It's just different. But no matter what, there's going to be plays that you have to follow. And as a trainee, when you sign on, that serious agreement says that you're going to follow the plays that are called. And even here at Living Hope, we do have ways to talk about things that you don't agree with. We have opportunities for you to share the things that you may see that you don't like. There is a way to file a grievance. There's a way to find out if, how the finances are run. All of those things are there and available to you. So don't think that because I say you got to coach and you got to follow every play that you know everything's hidden behind the curtain. It's not. Because if we're really sharing the lane, there is nothing hidden. Okay, remember me and my, and my goggles? There's nothing hidden. There's nothing hidden in the pool. And believe me, we're all sharing one big lane. Amen? So what did I get as a result of sharing my lane? First thing, I was sore. So that next day, my arms and my shoulders were, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even, like doing this is a luxury today. But that next day, after chasing that guy in the pool, I mean, I could, I could barely get this. And I was just so sore. So I'm sitting in the class, and I'm trying to stretch, and I can't because I hurt so bad. But you know what? Sharing your lane is hard. It is difficult. It does require uh, a certain level of fortitude to share your lane with someone else and to really walk life with people. And sometimes it might not seem rewarding. But let me tell you, it's incredibly rewarding. It's incredibly rewarding the first time that somebody you're, you've been talking to week in, week out, and, and, and they, you know that they're not a believer and they've never really even been interested in Christ, but you kind of drop those nuggets each and every time you're with them and you share a little bit here and you share a little bit there. And then one day you talk to them and they're like, you know what? I really need prayer. I really need you to pray for me. And you're able to talk to them about prayer and what that means to be in relationship with God. And you're actually able to pray with them and, and share with them who God is and, and let them know that there's a God in heaven. And praise God if they decide or if they feel led and they want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It is incredibly rewarding. You forget about that whole year of dealing with the stuff and walking all through Baltimore or doing whatever it is that you might have been doing with that person day in, day out. You forget all about that when God moves. Or if you're in a training class, like uh, my wife and I did when we were in Houston, and we spent years going to training classes after training class after training class, and your notes and, 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 and having to explain this, and the Old Testament, the New Testament, you're doing all that stuff. And then the very first time, I, and I'll speak for Carlton specifically as I hit my mic, um, getting up and, and, and giving the word and sharing the word the very first time in my church in Houston. All that stuff was forgotten. Those long Sundays of 8 a.m. service all the way through the 9 p.m. when the, the men's class, leadership class ended and not seeing my wife all day on Sunday, it made perfect sense when I actually stopped running from God and I shared his word to the people. And the first time that I was able to lead one of my God children to Christ, all of the arguments and all of the fighting, all of it disappeared. The day that she said, I really need God. And we prayed for her to understand what that meant. None of the arguments mattered. None of it matters. None of it matters. No matter how sore you are the next day, after you've been dealing with this person over and over again, you coaches out there and you get frustrated, it doesn't matter. Because God is doing a work in you, and he's doing a work in them, and you will not believe what he does when he does it. But you've got to call the plays if you're the coach. You've got to run the plays at the pier in the trainee level. And you trainees out there, you've got to learn what the plays are. Because in order to really walk this life and walk through it, you've got to share your lane with somebody else. You cannot do it alone. 
You cannot walk it by yourself. So that's why when you come to church on a Sunday, you should have Monday through Saturday been sharing what you heard the week before and been telling somebody, hey, you need to come with me on a Sunday. On a Wednesday night when we have Bible study, you need to say, oh, man, let me tell you, last week's Bible study, I was having this problem and we talked about it. And let's come and talk about Bible study. And when small groups start up, man, let me tell you about my small group, man. We're, we're you know, I'm trying to think of a small group topic, right? I don't, I don't have them in my head. I'll pick mine. I got a small group. It's all about guys and how you live as a man for Christ. Come, come on. Be a part. Find out what it means. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are excited because you do amazing things. You do amazing things. You call us to be a part of them, but God, you do amazing things. And so as we close out this message and as we close out today's sermon, we're so grateful that you believe in us. That you believed in us so much that you sent your son to die on a cross. You wanted to have relationship with us so much that you gave the very best you gave the very greatest. You gave the most that you could possibly give for us. And we are so grateful that you are able. That you're able to save. That you're able to heal. That you're able to provide. That you're able to lead. That you're able to be a friend. That you're able to hit us on the head when we need it. You are able that even when the winds and the waves came, you rebuked them and they called. You give us ample opportunity to move, ample opportunity to, to, to walk, ample opportunity to make mistakes. You're so patient. So I know, God, you've been talking to the people here as, we've been sh as the word has been shared, and I know that there are those who want to know more about this relationship with you, want to know who you are, want to connect with you in a greater way, want to connect with you for the first time. So continue to prick their hearts. Continue to reach them. Continue to hold on to them. Give them the, the, the heart to chase after you. And for those who may be hearing that, pulling on your heart, pulling in your spirit, all you have to do, pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins. Pray to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Pray to know him. Pray to embrace him. Pray to be close to him. Because he can take care of all the rest. For the family, this prayer time is for you as well. Pray that you find someone to share the lane with. Pray that you find somebody to grow in relationship with. Pray that you find someone who will challenge you. Pray that you find someone who helps you improve your form. Pray that you find someone who will practice with you, who will connect with you, who will grow with you. Pray that you find someone who's willing to teach you. Pray that you find someone who's willing to challenge you and grow you. And then pray and ask God to empower you to learn the things that you're being taught. To practice the fundamentals that you're finding. And to grow. To grow into what God has called you to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we prepare to sing our last song, and the ushers I know are going to be coming through to um, do the tithes and the offerings, I want to just uh, impart upon you the need to give. And we always share from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I ask that you would go back and you would read that. But just know that as we give, we give because God gave. But we also give because God has called us to live biblical lives. Lives that are budgeted. 
So as we go into this new year and we go into the season of prayer and fasting, understand that God has called you to budget your life in such a way that giving is part of who you are. So here we are at the beginning of the year. For my financial peace folks that are here in the room, we always talk about what are we going to do with the year? How are we going to give month in, month out? And I, I implore everybody who's out here to do the same thing. Giving is a budgeted activity in your life. You save money, you give money. You spend money, you give money. You make money, you give money, you spend money. It's a cycle, it happens. So make your gifts, your giving, part of your cycle. Amen? And I'm going to just pray over the offering, and then we're going to sing our last song. And I'm just going to say, God, just bless it. Let it be used to bless those locally and globally. Let it be multiplied for the furthering of your kingdom. Let it touch those to the far reaches of the earth, and let it take care of the obligations we have here. And God, continue to take care of the monies that we have left in our own pockets. Show us how to live budgeted lives. Show us how we can meet the obligations that we set in our own lives with what we have or what you've given us that's left over. And we know that you'll take care of it because you are a provider. In Jesus' name, amen.